Welcome to the Leader's Journey podcast. I'm your host, Joel Gunn, and today I have with me Lashad James. Lashad, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Good to be here. I've been excited to hang out with you and get to know you a little better. Yeah. We've met passing in the hallways here at Connected over the last few months. Um, and uh, you did a little magic show for us the other day at the, at the Connection uh, uh, Social. And so that was that was cool. Yeah. Did you like it? You're, yeah, you're quite yeah. the magician. Yeah. I was very impressed. Come on. I can tell you worked on that skill. Yeah. Uh, I'm always fascinated by up close magic. Mm-hmm. You know, that's uh, the big stuff's cool, but the up close stuff, it's really kind of uh, if you can fool the brain that close, mm-hmm. you know, that's yeah. that's a especially, lot of fun. I feel like especially smart people who know their who know their stuff. They know how reality works. You know, they're, they're paid to be experts. And then they walk in and they're like, wait a minute. You know, well, how did that happen? So, yeah. 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 I don't I don't get it. You know, yeah. that messes with some people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I enjoy the, the mystery of it. Yeah. And so before the show, we were talking about uh, your business owner, own a couple of businesses uh, with your father-in-law. Mm-hmm. You're not a native Texan, only been here less than a decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, are your kids Texans? I mean, they're, they're black. I mean, I don't know if they're Texans. I don't know. Were they born here? I, no. Or they, yeah, they were born here. Well, but they're like, Texan. But no, I feel like no. No, that's I, I just feel that's like, the way it works. No, come on. I feel like when you say I'm Texan. People start thinking like, okay, you like certain things. No, I don't know. I, no, like, I'm Texan. I'm telling you, I was born the, ten blocks from the Alamo. They're gonna be so happy if to hear that. They're born here. They're, they're Texan. Texan? Yes. Okay, they're gonna be so happy to hear. I'm they like, can't you get know away what? from it. It's like if you're born in America, you're American. Okay. If you're born in Texas, you're Texan. Then yes, they're Texans. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, then that's a, that's a saving grace for you. We're gonna be good friends. You got <laughs> Texas kids. So, yeah. Um, but but um, we were talking before the show. There's always some interesting family dynamics. Uh, you're millennial. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming your father in law's not. He's not. And uh, uh, so one of the things that that actually I've been in conversation with my son, who's a millennial, uh, Nathan over here behind the cameras, um, is that very topic is like. We've got stereotypical assumptions that we make about every generation. Mm-hmm. The baby boomers are like this. They're, you know, hyper conservative and mm-hmm. and they like to reuse things and they keep things they're never going to use again. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and then my generation is that, you know, the geeks and the, the uh, work hard to make a buck and, you know, yeah. uh, have a nice lifestyle when you retire. And then the millennials. And I think this is a great thing. We need more of it seem to be more open, generally speaking. Um, to relationships and mental health and uh, emotional things. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that or disagree with that, but I'd I'd like to maybe go there first. No, I I, I agree. And I think you see in any generation, the pendulum kind of swings from one side to another. And I don't think either one is right. I think the error we make is Mm -hmm. overcorrecting or demonizing the generations before so the generations after us. I think we're we're served best when we're able to work together. Uh, I think a lot of the reason why my generation is able to focus on mental health is because the generation before me focused so hard on preparing a space where food was, you know, not scarce and safety wasn't a concern. So now you are focusing more on that mental health aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say that's true everywhere, but I I always want to acknowledge that if I'm in a place where I can even think about those things, it's because I am not worried about other things. Mm, that's a good um, point. So I don't think I don't I don't I try not to pit one against the other, and I try to see like, hey, what's the beauty in in how this generation thinks or how this culture thinks versus maybe the next generation or another culture next to it. So, but I think you're right. There's definitely um, for my father-in-law and for the generations that have been before me more of a focus on duty, obligation, making sure you can financially provide. Um, and then in my generation, that's less emphasized and it's more about um, emotional well-being and uh, friendship and relational capital. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, your, your businesses are interesting. Uh, Nathan actually pointed this out before the show is not only are, are you in business with your father-in-law, so a Gen X or, uh, or whatever bracket he's in with a millennial, but uh, your business is to primarily interact with generations younger than you. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, am I allowed to say the name of your company on here? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Magnesium. Yeah. Right. So you're working with kids that are trying to get better at math mm-hmm. primarily. I'm sure you accomplish other things, self-esteem and, and some oh, yeah. of those things. Oh, yeah. uh, tell me a little bit um, about Mathnesium and what it is. And then I'd be curious to see um, 
compare and contrast what you're seeing in the younger generations to your generation to perhaps your father-in-law's generation. But let's let's talk about Mathnasium for a few yeah. minutes. Yeah, so, I mean, the skinny and the short of Mathnasium is the math learning center. Uh, I love it, the franchise is amazing. Um, and we help students that come to us after school. They have homework, they have tests, they have quizzes they need to study for, and they also have material that they're missing from last year that they need to catch up on. And so we're able to match them with a tutor that's gonna help them recover that old material, prepare for tests and quizzes, and get ready to kind of achieve and um, you know what they need to do for the next couple of years. And so whether that be getting into GT classes or passing the SAT, like we're there for that whole journey. Um, what I've noticed as maybe a difference um, I'll be, you know, I'll be honest, it's it's hard to notice a difference because when you're dealing with children, children's brains and the way that they think are are so different. It, it almost doesn't matter the generation. Like, they're very lighthearted. They're very open. They're very transparent. So I don't think they've necessarily found themselves yet. Mm -hmm. Or um, So I'd have to really think about I have to really think about that one. But I do definitely notice the difference between how my father-in-law likes to lead and how where his focus is and where his areas of, um, his areas of focus are versus mine. And then trying to incorporate both his areas of focus and my areas of focus together to make a more two and three dimensional view of our business mm -hmm. has been the challenge because uh, if I'm not careful, I'll either want to adopt the way he thinks and disregard the way I think because I'm either younger or I just, I'm not really secure in my own competencies mm -hmm. um, or I'll dismiss the way that he thinks uh, as, you know, archaic and, and just different and, and wrong, right? Demonize it. Mm -hmm. And so trying not to have to defend or defeat him and how he thinks has been really helpful. And mm. so I think uh, that's one difference I, I can say. Have you, uh, I'll give you a second to think about this, but are there any stories that might help me or, or the audience uh, start to understand a little bit about what you're saying there? And um, have there been opportunities to demonize him? Oh, yeah. You know, and, and what was that like and how'd you wrestle through that? Yeah. And then I'm, I'm sure there was things he said or done that's opened you up to the idea of valuing his input, right? Yeah. So um, he retired in the Air Force as a, as a colonel. And so his uh, understanding of leadership and management is very heavily based in kind of a military understanding of, of leadership and development. There's one example where it's a simple question of how much do we pay our instructors? Like, you know, should we pay them $10 an hour, which is what it was when we first started maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, then the wage rate started going up, HEB started paying more and other places started paying more. And the question was like, do we raise how much we pay? And I think we start, he started the conversation from a more of a financial perspective of, hey, this is gonna cost us more money we need to just, you know, maybe slow down on how we're going to give raises or at least think through, you know, how we give raises. And it was more so my thought process of, hey, why don't we start by uh, asking for what we want? Like if I want a high quality instructor, like let's just go ahead and pay them what I'm looking for and we can continue to train and work from there. And so uh, it kind of became a numbers battle a little bit, but it was more on philosophy. But we ended up, uh, it's, and it's crazy, now that you mentioned this, I didn't even think about this. We ended up making a hybrid of both to where um, they'll start at our base rate, but then they're given a training pathway. And then as they work through that training pathway themselves, it's self-paced up to the level that I would have originally just hired them on at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I don't know who I was with. Um, I think Rudy's Barbecue might have a similar like 90 day training, some sort of 90 day onboarding training model to mm -hmm. where it's more self-paced. Uh, don't quote me on that, but that's where I stole the idea from. Mm -hmm. And I kind of modified it with another business owner. And um, so it ended up being a hybrid of mm -hmm. both to say, hey, if we're gonna start you off at this amount, that's you know fair, especially since you're training, and you don't know what you're doing, but it's gonna be self-paced and you can work your way through it. And it's not, um, there's no tricks to it. Just do the training, mm -hmm. show the competency, and then you'll be raised up to the level of maybe what HEB might start you at. <laughs> do you mind if I ask how old are your instructors, kind of a age range? Yeah, so uh, high school seniors to about college juniors okay. and seniors. So, yeah. yeah. So um, that's interesting because that's the that's the demographic that a lot of my business clients are having trouble attracting. Mm-hmm. So mm -hmm. have you had the similar and how do you attract them? And yeah. you know, what's, what's that process look like? So that's, that's a really good question. So my Mathnasium, uh, actually we keep our instructors two or three times longer than most of Mathnasiums like around the, the, 
the nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'm not going to give exact numbers, but there's there's a turnover rate that we have calculated, and I've always surpassed that. My people stay with me for three, four years, and it's not because I'm trying to manipulate them into staying. I actually try to grow them out of their position and into another position. So I've um, I have multiple instructors that went on to teach in high schools after leaving us. Like it's, they don't go leave us for a lateral position. They don't leave us for you know one or two dollars more. A lot of them will move on to work inside of schools, and so. But that's after being with us for three or four years, and I've given them everything I possibly can, healthcare, and you know as much of a raise as makes sense for the industry that we're in. And, you know, I'm looking at them like, I think it is time for you to go ahead and go. Like you, you graduated two years ago and, you know, mom and dad are probably wondering when you're going to get the quote unquote, you the know, real job. the real job. Right. <laughs> but they love, they love, they love working at Mathnasium. Yeah. And so, um, well, at they, least you're Mathnasium. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I've, I feel like I've had success in retention. I've, obviously there's been some, some hiccups where if I'm not as uh, plugged into the center and the culture and, and culture starts to slip and, um, I think a lot of the overtones that our culture has against like not working or not liking your boss or hating your job, I think that's a really heavy cultural overtone that you'll see on social media where um, the issues that you're having at work are because of bad job, bad boss, you know, Mm -hmm. so that can creep in really quickly. Mm -hmm. But when we have a good pulse on our culture, people stay for indefinitely. Mm -hmm. I've had people who have been offered jobs for more money and they don't take it. They know they can leave and go make three or four dollars more, but they don't. Wow. They don't go because. Um, Have you found yeah. any secret sauce in attracting that talent? Uh, this is an age-old one, but a lot of it is referrals from our current people. Mm-hmm. Birds of a feather flock together. We have amazing instructors who fit our culture really well and we'll ask them i'll pay them like go find me one of your friends that fits this culture really well mm-hmm. and uh, Part of it is that they will reflect that same culture of their friend, and then another part of it is that friend doesn't has their neck out for the friend that they brought on. So they don't they don't they they come in and say, "Hey, don't screw this up!" Like yeah. you know, you're making me look bad. And if someone no shows or shows up late, you know, instead of me having to be the go to person, I'll just look at their friend and say, "What's going on here?" Like you know, you 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 vouch for this person, and and they're not showing up. And so I think you take advantage of uh, a lot of the latent potential in their friendship to help continue to keep them accountable to their job. And so uh, that's been one thing that's been really yeah. helpful. So, thinking back to five years ago when you were getting started, how did you initially find that talent? Uh, was it trial and error? Was trial, it, yeah, a lot, of it, a lot of it was trial and error. Um, there's so many techniques on, you know, trying to make sure your culture is right in your business and, mm-hmm. and things like that. But um, I think a lot of it was, was trial and error at first and uh, using a lot of the techniques that people find online for you know, having a good work culture, employee engagement. Mm-hmm. But I, I'll be honest with you, my job is how I serve my community and, and how I serve the world. So I don't, I, I see professional development and discipleship as the same thing. Like it's all integrated in my mind of, of human flourishing might be language I've heard around here connected. Like it's, it's all connected. And so as I love you and serve you, I'm not just growing you as an instructor, I'm growing you as a human. So things like having integrity, it's not just about showing up on time because I need you here at work. It's about showing up for yourself and having integrity and being where you say you're going to be. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the culture was developed by me bringing my full self to my leadership position Mm -hmm. and not viewing my role as just an HR professional developer, talent management type of person. Mm -hmm. But to say, if, if my job is to make disciples and to love people and help people know God and know themselves well, then the conversations that we're able to have after work are going to be more towards them developing into a better person. Mm-hmm. And a byproduct of that is that they're going to be a great instructor. And that, that, I think that really took off because conversations become more about more deeper. And again, the byproduct of that is that the center is going to have a warmth and a love to it mm-hmm. that wouldn't exist just by focusing on them as instructors. If I went in and surveyed your team today uh, and asked them to give me words that would describe your culture, what do you think those words would be? Uh, so it's funny. I actually tried to, the, the Q12 survey from Gallup, the one that the, the employee engagement one where they asked, like, do you have a best friend at work or something like that? So I just did that last week. Um, what would I say? That loving, caring, there's harmony, there's friendship, uh, funny, easygoing, 
Mm-hmm. Um, how, do, how do you think your your students, do you refer to them as students? Yeah. How do you think your students, how would they describe your mathnasiums? Probably the same exact words. Okay. Here's the story. Like I've, I've had students who have volleyball games coming up that they're really proud of, and they'll invite the tutors to come to the volleyball games. And then all the tutors will, you know, hop in a car and go to the school, never been to the school day in their life, don't have any friends or family that go to that school, but they're there because of the relationship, the tutoring relationship that they have with the child. Wow. We've made signs at the center, got poster board, made signs, and just went crazy just celebrating the student. Um, and that's just, you know, that's that's one example of how personal those relationships can can get, mm-hmm. um, and it's uh, again that's just a byproduct of I think the f- and I, I I use the word family really loosely, but the team atmosphere that we're be- that's being built, um, they feel that freedom to say hey how can we love this person well, mm-hmm. and they know that that my expectation is is beyond the tutoring which needs to happen it needs to be excellent they need to be loving their people well and they need to make this world a better place and use mathnasium as a vehicle to do that mm-hmm. and I, if i had to summarize i'd say mathnasium and the job itself is a the success of that is a byproduct of loving each other well mm-hmm. that's the focus it's not on just running the numbers up in the business which is good mm-hmm. we have to have the numbers focus mm-hmm. um, but i hope that they push past that and say okay what does loving this student well look like sometimes it's putting the homework down for five minutes and asking them about their day sometimes it's going to their basketball games um, for me as their leader i will go over the dashboards and all of that but sometimes it's me putting that down and asking them about their marriage mm. and that's become so normal for us that I think it reflects to the students and um, again the the culture is a byproduct of us loving each other in that way I love it uh, so so this might be a, f- a fun question or conversation yeah my both my parents are professional educators um, by, okay. degree, uh-huh. by degree and practice and uh, as a kid growing up in that home uh, public school systems didn't necessarily pay my parents, you know, what Michael Jordan and those guys make. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and so I often wrestled with this idea of, you know, these scientists and these professors um, and, and these business leaders are to a great degree where they are because of the teachers that helped get them there. Mm-hmm. Right. And and then I'd look at what's my my parents' compensation or teachers' compensation, and then I'd look at these these other compensations, doctors, that wouldn't be doctors had they not gone through, you know, all these all these education moments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and granted, there's an effort on the student, and but there's also the teacher's willingness to sow love, care, compassion, showing up to a game that you don't have to be at, all those kinds of things that really good teachers tend to do, mm-hmm. um, and yet the pay is so... so um, magnitudes different and so i really i kind of wrestled with that as a young man like that's not fair then as i as i got older and started thinking about it it's like you know what i actually don't want everybody wanting to be a teacher just to get the big salaries because then they lost the heart of mm-hmm. being a teacher because they love kids mm-hmm. what, what are your thoughts on on those topics yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing that pops in my head is, is a quote I've heard that, that volume isn't value. And so the value that the teacher brings to the classroom isn't always reflected in the volume of money that they're getting paid. I don't think it it it, it rarely is. Right. And teachers know this. Anyone who works with children, you know that the, the soft skills that you need to have and the, the, the emotions that spent on, on loving your students well, um, it's not going to it's not going to match up. Um, but. I think you mentioned something really good is that if 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 we overpay for this, maybe people lose that that purpose and they 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 can be in it for the money. And so I think it's actually healthy to start to divorce your purpose from your paycheck a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be very careful as I say that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think is I I think it is healthy to understand that volume isn't value and that if I know what my purpose is in life and what God has called me to, the finances can be a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you see that in scripture so many times. I mean, first page of the Bible, God literally gives humanity the world, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, they, they, they have all the resources that they could possibly want, mm-hmm. but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was for them to actually steward it well. And so in that moment, you see that at our core, our income and our paycheck isn't connected to our purpose. They're, mm-hmm. they're kind of separate. They, But the 
resources are a byproduct of the purpose. Mm-hmm. Same thing with children of Israel. Like when they children of Israel, whenever they're freed from Egypt and they're given all of this gold from the Egyptians, like now they have this gold, which they later used to make a golden calf. And then they later, later used to make a temple. But like their, their purpose was, uh, the resources was a byproduct of whatever the purpose that God had for their life. And so I think as we carry that story forward and Jesus starts talking about money and not serving God and money, and um, he starts giving teachings on on how to handle finances, I think the focus should be on what is the purpose and the value that you bring to the world as you love your neighbor well. Mm-hmm. And then just know that that financial part, it, it will take care of itself and and it'll be a byproduct of what that purpose is. But mm-hmm. I think you're right in saying maybe we shouldn't always connect the most important jobs we have to the highest money that we pay them because then the purpose can get lost. And I think we all love people who just love their job because they love their job. And then we just hope they're fairly compensated Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. pay their own bills. You know, as you were sharing that, I I wonder if that's not one of the things that we were talking about before we came on the air and a little bit at the beginning. I I think I can make the argument millennials do that better. Mm -hmm. There's a purpose and there's there's a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I, I think millennials by nature tend to separate those yeah. better than other generations have. Yeah. Um, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, and again, I think it might be hopefully not an overcorrection, but it's a correction from maybe in generations past where the job was to provide, put food on the table, take care of your family. And it didn't matter how you felt about your job. It didn't matter how you felt about your coworkers. It didn't, maybe it didn't matter how the money was being made, but the money was coming home mm-hmm. and if we go too far in that direction, you have children who grow up and say, I want to love my job and I want to do what I love and I want to follow my passions, which again, that could be an overcorrection. But I do think there's a sweet spot in that tension Mm -hmm. of saying, I would like to do what I'm called to do by God. Because I think, honestly, I think that's what the root of it is. When people say, follow your passion and follow your heart and I want to love my job, I think what they're trying to get at is I want God to give me a God-given mission that he's wired me for, that he's blessed me and gifted me to do. Mm-hmm. And then I want him to cultivate it and bring it forth so that I can bless the world with what I have. I think that's the mm-hmm. the deeper ask of it. But when you take God out of it, it just starts to say, follow your passions and skills and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to go back to your, your question, yeah, I think the balance is, can I do not just what I love, but what I'm called to do? Can I do what I'm called to do? and then have that be matched with being able to put food on a table. And I think that's the blessing that we read about in, I think it's in Ecclesiastes where it's like, you know, what, what's the best thing for a person that they can eat and drink? And, and uh, I'm going to misquote it. I might have to put Love it their family. Spot. And yeah, it's yeah. Like he takes it back to the basics that, mm-hmm. that you can put food on the table, but you can also work. And so, um, uh, but yeah, I think that's the, hopefully it's not an overcorrection, but there's mm-hmm. a sweet spot in the middle of providing, but then also doing what the Lord has called you to do in your life. How do you how do you practice that uh, in your companies where you help people divorce this idea of my identity is tied to my paycheck? Is there any practical like I know some organizations, they do the annual review and then six months later or some months later, they do the pay increases. So like that's a way to separate who I am, what my value is what I need to work on, what, what I'm good at, uh, from the conversation about payroll and paychecks. And I don't know, have you found anything in, in your businesses where, where you are able to help articulate or help people realize that, that, that purpose is more important than the paycheck necessarily. And it sounds like you have, whether you've done it on purpose or not, sounds like you've created that culture. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's interesting that you ask that question. You're really good at asking questions. You've been doing this for a while because I didn't think about that until you said it. But yes, um, when I start off the conversation about money, I'm very upfront. What do you need? Right. Mm-hmm. I don't want money to be in the back of your mind as you're working. I don't want you flirting with other jobs over a dollar difference. If I can just solve that right now, I really want you to be able to bring your full self to work and not have to worry about pinching pennies at the end of the week. And mm-hmm. so um, I've had instructors that are just working for the res to put it on their resume. I've had instructors that do need to pay their car note and they're very upfront with me about what they need. Mm-hmm. And then I'm able to try to meet that or be as open and honest about what that could look like. Mm-hmm. Um, now when that is taken care of, then, the, then that conversation is normally taken care of for six to eight months, maybe a year or so mm-hmm. they're okay. And they feel comfortable coming back to me if they need to change it. Mm-hmm. So then I can focus all my attention on what are your strengths? What does the Lord asked you to do? 
What are the ex what are your expectations of yourself? What are mom and dad's expectations? Do they match? Like, how do we have more integrity in what we're doing? And sometimes that conversation is going to lead us to you leaving Mathnasium, but in a good way, because you you quickly realize, like I, I had a I had an instructor tell me, I care about the environment. Like I love recycling and I want to recycle all the paper here at Mathnasium. Now it wasn't logistically uh, feasible, right? But that's, that was her passion. But I let her run wild with that. I say, if you can find a way to get this recycling done, go for it. And then over time, as she began to exercise those giftings and like changing our light bulbs to be more efficient and helping us recycle, it just dawned on her. She wants to do this full time. She mm. wants to work uh, as a person who can help the environment or as an environmentalist and mm. uh, full time. And so she sent me an email and say, and she said, I'm, I'm leaving Mathnasium because I want to go full time with this. And I said, Awesome. It's mm -hmm. perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to stoke that fire of what has God put inside of you mm -hmm. that I'm called to steward, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm, I'm just, I'm talent management is one thing. I'm stewarding the gift that God has put inside of you, right? I'm stewarding the purpose he's put inside of you. I, I don't want you here a day longer than God does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want you here a single day longer than you should be, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want you to leave a day sooner than you should, but I'm always aware that this, I'm stewarding you. Right. I'm, I don't own you. I don't I can't control you. I don't own you. I'm stewarding you. And so um, how did I separate their how do I separate that conversation of like the money from like the actual purpose? I think, number one, I was just really upfront about what do you actually need? Mm -hmm. And then I always try to meet or exceed that so that you know that I'm I'm generous. I'm going to give I'm going to give to you first before I ask you of anything. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that models a lot of how God leads people. Mm -hmm. He blesses their socks off like kind of first or foremost as giving the greatest gifts possible before he starts that kind of working relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to take care of their basic needs and then I start just asking them questions about, all right, what are your goals? You know, how many classes until you graduate? What do you, what do you want to do after you graduate? Do you like your degree path? How can we help you switch? Mm -hmm. um, I've had people who started at my business and they wanted to go back to college, but they kept dragging their feet. And so I paid for the team to, to, the team to stay after to make sure they get enrolled in college and just simple stuff like that. So they ended up getting enrolled, um, graduating and then leaving Mathnasium. But it was, that was the, that's the plan. And so yeah. I hope that answers your question. No, it's it kind does. of a roundabout way, but. No, it absolutely does. <clears throat> you're, you're very comfortable expressing your faith in the, in, in the context of business. Mm -hmm. Are you as comfortable when you're interviewing a candidate in, in saying, I want to help you find your God given purpose? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, and I'm, I'm okay, depending on who I'm talking to, I'm okay substituting God with what they would call God. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think as we, as we journey, because I'm on a journey of learning about God's character, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And before I start throwing a name that you need to say at you, I can, I'm, a, I'm totally okay entering your world about what you believe about universe or karma or whatever. And, um, and I think people are actually really open to that. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I'm okay talking about faith. I think it's, uh, I think it's, I don't know how to really explain it, but if I, if I ask something about truth or like, should, is lying okay? And they say, no, why is not lying? You know, why is that not the case that lying's okay? Or, mm -hmm. they, they'll start to share their faith. And so mm -hmm. um, it kind of comes up really naturally. And I think, uh, I, yeah, I create a lot of space for them to think differently than me. Well, the, the reason I, I bring that up is so many Christian business owners are nervous about somehow introducing or integrating their faith into work conversations. And, um, and, I, and it sounds like you've found winsome ways, and I've, I've, uh, you know, become a student of this over the last eight year, nine years or so. Is what are those winsome ways that we can introduce our faith into the conversations? And and so the the question that uh, mm -hmm. follow up question is, have you ever freaked anybody out, uh, or have they sued you, or have you know like cussed you out, or like? Because yeah. that's the fear, right? That, yeah. that most Christians in the marketplace have is like, well, if I'm too vocal about my faith. Um, then they're, you know, I'm going to alienate or I'm going to ostracize or I'm going to offend or so I'm just curious what your experience has been. I think that's because a lot of business leaders, they take their evangelistic cues from street preachers and, and televangelists and preachers mm -hmm. that are always screaming and monologuing mm -hmm. more than they take it from Jesus mm -hmm. who could just have a conversation with you about anything, mm -hmm. um, and find a way to invite you into the kingdom of God, which has people who are generous and loving and caring and um and so and I, and I don't mean that to be i don't mean that to be rude when i say that but sure. i think as you as you look at jesus uh so many people think that when i talk about my faith i have to talk about salvation salvation wasn't the crux of jesus's 
message to people. It was the kingdom of God. And so as he talks about the kingdom of God, we could start a conversation about inheritances. We could start a conversation about wages. We could start a conversation about should we pay taxes to Caesar? We could start a conversation about food or healing or doesn't whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to rub against um, a philosophy about how life should be lived, the good life, right? Blessed are the people who do X, Y, or Z. Like it's going to rub against like how life should be lived. And when you get into that realm of philosophy about how life should be lived, well, you're right inside of a a space to talk about the kingdom of God. And so um, when people ask me, like, let's say there's a news article that pops up and someone's done something or said something that we agree is wrong. Well, we're going to agree it's wrong, but for two different reasons. I might think it's wrong because I think humans should um, love each other even if we disagree. And then I just throw that out there as a truth claim and you're going to throw out a truth claim. And if you want, if I want to know your sources on why you believe that, then I just ask, well, why? Why do you believe that it's okay to be mean to your political opponent or something like that? You know, Mm -hmm. and then you ask me why I think that's not okay. And eventually we're going to have to make a truth claim about the ruler of the universe Mm -hmm. and how the and how the universe runs smoothly and who designed it that way. Mm -hmm. And you're right in conversation about God. Mm -hmm. So. And and how do people react when you when you go there, generally speaking? Yeah, well, I I like to make uh, I like to make truth claims and spiritual statements that are easily dismissible, mm-hmm. but they also serve as breadcrumbs because Jesus Jesus would say things like those with ears to hear let them hear, mm-hmm. or he would say a teaching and people might follow up with him afterwards. And I've seen it happen in my personal life so many times where I'll start talking about biblical principles or just the ways of practicing the ways of Jesus and how I'm trying to live it out, and I say it as a I say it in the same way you would recommend a shirt to me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I like this shirt, I like the cotton, I like this, I like that. And I say, well, why? Well, I believe X, Y, or Z. And you're saying, you're giving, you're just submitting it to me, but I could easily dismiss it and you wouldn't be offended. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're not trying to knock out, you're not trying to swing for a home run here, right? Mm -hmm. You're not trying to convert me to your shirt. You're just, you're just having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I make spiritual statements that are just a natural part of the conversation. They're easily dismissible, Mm -hmm. uh, but very often people will stick around after our team meetings and they'll just they'll they'll purposefully lag behind and it's really awkward because I'm grabbing my keys and I'm kind of like you know you how you say bye like three or four times and they're just waiting for everyone else to leave but because they don't leave another person doesn't leave and so it becomes this awkward like standoff of but they end up staying back and they say Mr. James I have a question about my you know a situation happened with my girlfriend or I have a question about a situation over here and um and then we end up having a deeper conversation about nice. spiritual matters. Nice. Yeah, it sounds sounds uh, like we should be running our businesses the, the way we should be interacting with people, and and uh, like you said, Jesus was was quite engaging and inviting, and people felt comfortable around him. Mm-hmm. You know, and he didn't. The only people he really upset was the religious leaders. Mm-hmm. You know, and he'd call them vipers and other call them names even mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, uh but to the the general population he was he was you know quite compassionate mm-hmm. and people recognized that in him and, and saw it as different mm-hmm. like you know what so it was attractive it was magnetic yeah because uh, he was able to just meet him where they were and have a conversation yeah and um that's cool so so no real backlash on you sharing your faith over the years no uh, and, and I love it when I hear that from from Christian business leaders, you know, that are able to say, look, I, I've been trying this. I try to live my life this way. and I'm not been sued or thrown in jail yet. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and none of it and none of it. I've had I've had in, uh, I've had employees that are re- that they feel reluctant to share with me their belief system because they think that they'll be uh, punished because mm-hmm, of it. Mm-hmm. And um over time, I've I've been able to tell them like, hey, I don't I don't mind if you believe differently. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and I've had I've had employees tell me that my God is a flying spaghetti monster, and that you know Christians are unintelligent sheeple who just follow a book that is full of flaws. And I'm I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. Like, I'm totally okay with believing different. I'm totally okay with you believing differently than me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm actually and when I hear that, I'm actually happy because now I get to show you. Uh, the love of God in a way that you might not tangibly get from th- the, your circle of friends. And so I see it as a great opportunity of sharing more about the kingdom. And and also knowing that discipleship doesn't mean converting you to Christianity. It's helping you walk in the ways of Jesus. If I help you start practicing the ways of Jesus, you're already being discipled. 
you might we might not ever get to the salvation part. And I think I, not that I'm avoiding it. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Mm-hmm. But if I can get you to work on your integrity and to believe that telling the truth is always going to be better than lying, then I've to help you start to walk in the ways of Jesus. If I help you to be more generous, I'm helping you practice the ways of Jesus, even if you wouldn't. Even if you don't understand salvation and atonement and those big kind of doctrinal things that we want to jump to first, mm-hmm. uh, if I can get you to live into the kingdom of God and and being kind and generous and doing what you say you're going to do, and then I'm already you're already being discipled. Well, and that would be that would be you emulating Christ with His disciples, mm-hmm. right? He didn't reveal all the deep dark uh, uh, scriptures mm-hmm. at at first. Mm-hmm. He was like, go feed those people. You know? Boom. Go serve those people. Go wash their feet. Go do this. Go, mm-hmm. you know, um, and and uh, the the current series, the chosen, has I think done a great job, you know, really showing some of the practical stuff that they they were doing. Go go find a donkey and go get a get an upper room, you mm-hmm. know, prepared for a party. So there was very practical things they were learning to serve people, mm-hmm. you know, in the process. And and you know, they're like, well, let's call down lightning on him and and he's like guys what what are you <laughs> what are you so upset about let's mm-hmm. you know think about this oh okay yes yes I, I i see that now you know so this this idea of helping people find their better self um i love i love that context and in, in how you're living out your life and, and serving others that's yeah. that's beautiful and, and also to be clear for the people who might be listening like well when because I, I i get this question a lot so when do you talk about when do you talk about jesus like how does this strategy ever lead to a person putting saving faith in christ and i would say to that person who might be saying who might be thinking that um the deepest levels of generosity love and forgiveness because when you start when i start saying hey i think you should forgive that person well, no, I need to get them back. I don't think you have to get revenge on them to, for you to feel better. I think there's a way for you to forgive and find peace without having to get revenge. As we start talking about the deepest expressions of forgiveness or generosity, mm-hmm. the question will always come up, how is that possible? Yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. Or where where would you get this model from? Mm-hmm. Or how are you able to forgive like that? Like before people have asked me how I'm able to, to, to pray for people or do like supernatural things, they've asked me, how do I forgive? If, you know, my fiance at the time cheats on me and we still get married and now we're nine years later, we have a happy, healthy marriage. How is that possible that I cheated on my wife, but now we have a, a happy marriage now? Like, where is the trend? They, they want to know how does forgiveness and transformation happen? And it's not, they're not asking me, how do I raise the dead or how do I, you know, I mean, they might care about <laughs> eventually, those sure, yeah. eventually, sure. But um, a lot of it is as you talk about the kingdom of God and generosity, they're going to ask, how are you able to be so generous? How do you know you're going to be taken care of? And then I'm like, well, now you've asked a deeper question that yeah. has the answer is going to be God. Mm-hmm. The answer is going to be our relationship with Jesus. And so and I, and I tell them, you don't have to go. You might not have you might not be ready to go that far as of yet. But I'm I will tell you that my generosity is an extension of the relationship I have with God through mm-hmm. Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're not ready for that, it's OK, but I, I'd give it a try, you know, mm-hmm. taste and see. Yeah. Try it out. <laughs> see what happens. Love it. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned marriages. Uh, you and your wife have a podcast. We do, uh, primarily around marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so, this came from uh, the podcast was birthed because I was I found myself giving relationship advice and I was pitting myself like over and over again. And I said, you know what? I'm going to just start recording some of this stuff. That way, I have like a library to where people could just reference it whenever they want to. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't have a huge marketing strategy for it. It was literally me just being tired of saying the same thing over and over again and wanting to just refer people back to a conversation. Because mm-hmm. every time I talk about overcoming addiction to pornography, every time I talk about overcoming infidelity, um, every time I talk about you know overcoming addictions to video games, it, 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 it always tends to like spark a deeper conversation of people who are struggling with the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm like, why don't we just record it and whoever wants it can get it. And so didn't have a name for it. And so I looked in the mirror and I was like, I'm young, I'm black, I'm a Christian, I'm married. So I'm going to call it young black, <laughs> young black married Christian podcast. <laughs> and uh, which caused some confusion, uh, rightfully so, but it was simple <laughs> enough where people, they knew what they were getting into. They clicked on it. They realized, you know, the, the, the theme matched. It's Christian. It has a Christian culture. It comes from a black culture as well. So mm-hmm. that blended enough for them. They just, they run with it. They, they play it. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it's been uh, strangely successful. Um, it's simple. It's mm-hmm. what people want to 
this exactly what they want to hear and in the time that they really need it. I've had I've had people reach out to me saying like, you know, I just discovered my husband's been watching pornography and potentially buying hookers online and mm. your pod like it's like deep stuff like in they'll reach out and say, could you please like kind of help us in this in this space? So, mm. yeah. Well, um, is there anything post pandemic that is uh, kind of a I hate to say hot topic, but like something mag- marriages really seem to be struggling with? Are there any themes that you're seeing? I haven't noticed a change post pandemic. Okay. I think we're at a place now where we're still just being honest about the problems we've had for the past five years, or six okay. years, seven years. So okay. same old, same old stuff, same old Corinthians, stuff. <laughs> you know, Book of Corinthians stuff, you know, um, I, what, yeah. What would you say the, the, oh, what's the right term? The, the major issue or the top three major issues, the marriages that you talk to, what, what are people struggling with most? Well, and this, this sounds, sounds bad because it's like asking someone who works in the ER, like, what's the problem with San Antonio? Yeah. And they're like, well, bullet wounds, I guess, you know, uh, or like I, the trauma, right? It's right. crisis events, right? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the stuff I, I deal with are mainly in crisis events. So budgeting conversations is really high up there. Mm. Sexual integrity issues mm-hmm. is high up there. Um, communication, which is really broad in general, but uh, communication mm. issues, just husbands not being as responsive, maybe kind of cold or calculated. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be the top three communications, budgeting, sexual integrity. So, so I've heard, um, one of, and this has been consistent the whole, I, my wife and I'll be married 37 years this summer. Come on. It's been, been consistent. Our whole married life, um, is what's the, you know, the top issues in marriage. And it's almost always finances in the top three, certainly in the top five. Mm. Uh, even when the economy is good, certainly when the economy is bad, um, what what are you finding that um, is is our different generations struggle with the financial conversation differently, or is it pretty much always the same? I think it's pretty much always the same, and it's because uh, Jesus would say, "Where your treasure is, there your heart is." Right? Mm-hmm. Um, when they ask the question, "Should we pay taxes to Caesar?" It's basically asking for more of like a pledge of allegiance, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. and I think uh, when you have your budget, you're able to vote on your priorities. And so, I might not be able to explain to you uh, how much I value you, or the family, or the kids, or myself, or my hobby, but you'll see it when our bank account dips under a certain amount and you're wondering why well now we have a conversation about values because we're having a conversation about budgeting and so a lot of times when people are having financial issues or budgeting issues you know it, it's never it's never a mathematical problem that they're trying to solve it's a behavioral problem uh which is rooted in a value system difference and so if my number three most important thing is your number eight most most important thing well larger portion of what I spend is going to go somewhere different than where you think it is. And now we have to come together and communicate. And so we would call that a budgeting issue, but it's not, it's really my husband or my spouse doesn't value what I value at the level that I value it. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're arguing. We can't see eye to eye. So I want to save and they want to do something Mm -hmm. different or yeah. Yeah, One of the things that really helped uh, my wife and I was when we heard Dave Ramsey Describe the free spirit. And I'm like, that's her. Yeah, She's yeah. the free spirit. Yes. <laughs> that helps so much, right? Yeah. But then he didn't demonize the free spirit. Right. 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 He turns around and, and gives that person a place at the table, right? Yeah. 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 And so that was quite freeing for us as one. I was able to now articulate how she was wired and in the process started to better understand how she made decisions. Yeah. You know, and what she was looking for. And and you know, and he turns to the to the more conservative mm-hmm. wired person. And I forget what he calls, what he calls us, the, but the free spirit and the Nate, do you know what it is? The free spirit and the, yeah. oh gosh, I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm the, the other guy. Yeah. The budget. I'm, right? I'm the, I'm the save Save, and the calculate saver, and, but yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, so for her, it was, you know, and he turns, he turns to me basically and says, you got to give her some blow money. Yeah. Right. You can't constrain every penny. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, as long as we, and then he goes on to explain it, you, you allocate, you know, 20 bucks or 50 mm-hmm. bucks or whatever the number is, but that's money. She gets to do whatever she wants with, and you don't ever ask her where that money goes. Mm-hmm. And so it was just those little things that me understanding more how she was wired. She understanding more how I was wired really start to allow us to get to a very healthy place. Um, 
And so what, what was an Achilles heel for us early in our marriage is actually a strength for us now um, because we, um, f- for many years, we would meet regularly, like it was in my calendar. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to review how we spent the last week and we're going to forecast what, and we did it as a team. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it actually became a strong area in our, in our marriage. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it was a lot of pain getting there. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think society in general, we don't like pain, mm-hmm. right? And, but sometimes to get to a healthy place, she had her very strong opinions. I had my very strong opinions and we hadn't been to marriage seminars. <laughs> and so we didn't really have tools to process that. Yeah. So it was just, you know, it was just duke it out uh, yeah. and, and so to speak. And, uh, and eventually we found a, something that, you know, God led us to something that worked. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I wouldn't say it's particularly unique, but I don't hear other couples that have a meeting every week to discuss finances. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the meeting people tend to avoid, mm-hmm. right? Because um, they don't want to have the argument. But I think uh, we we the first probably three years of meetings we argued every meeting, but yeah. we were moving toward a healthier place, you know. Yeah, so yeah, but I I like to reframe that budgeting time uh, as a actually a point of connection, right? Intimacy mm-hmm. is just into me see. So when when I show you how I spent my money, I am communicating mm-hmm. my value system, mm-hmm. and I'm actually giving you an opportunity to see into me. That's why finances are something that's so personal and intimate. It's almost like like I I that people would rather take their shirt off in front of you than show you their bank statements because they that one is more personal than another. Mm-hmm. But with whenever we're able to come together and say, hey, this is what I value and I haven't had a way, we haven't had time to talk about it. Maybe I haven't found a time to segue into this conversation, mm-hmm. but I really value this thing, which is why it's on our bank statement. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want you to value it the way that I value it, or at least want you to understand it mm-hmm. um, and help me get to this goal because we're spending money to get at something. And so um, instead of us fighting against each other, we can be on the same team because now I can see you. So it's like, it's again, intimacy. I can see into your heart. I know what's important to you. I know what you're, what you're striving for as a family, what you're willing. I know what you're willing to sacrifice Mm -hmm. for. That's good. I know where your treasure is. I know where your heart is. And so I can bond with you and we can partner together. And that doesn't mean we have to even necessarily, uh, I don't have to necessarily agree with it, but I can still partner Mm-hmm. with it at mm-hmm. some level, right? I can honor it, partner with it, and then incorporate it into what I'm trying to do so we can move together as a team, which, yeah. So it can be, it can be, uh, it can be a good, fun. Uh, yeah, no, it's, time. it's an, um, it has created more intimacy in, in our marriage, being on the same team, you know, uh, it's increased our level of trust mm-hmm. uh, because when spouses aren't talking about money, yeah. You know, you're then, thinking about it. Then. You know, then you're thinking, <laughs> thinking about, about it, it yeah. just not talking about just it. Just not talking about it. Uh, and and so then there's well, uh, this this un this unspoken thing about well I'm I don't because I don't value what you value or understand what how you value it. I can let that become a distrust. Yeah, so I, I form an underlying narrative about you. Mm-hmm. You're 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 lazy. Mm-hmm. I won't say that, mm-hmm. but. I know why you spend your money the way you spend your money because you have no self control. Mm-hmm. You never have. Mm-hmm. Since I've, and then you start these underlying narratives start mm-hmm. forming underneath your marriage, and they become uh, uh, they spring up, and this bitterness springs up and just defiles many. It's just it's, you have this bitterness that just springs up underneath a conversation about whether or not to get the steak or the crawfish. Now becomes a deeper meaning, a deeper argument mm-hmm. that's being fueled by an underlying narrative that I think you are impulsive and immature. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, instead of talking about my feelings, it, I, I've heard somebody say that if you don't talk it out, you act it out, right? Mm-hmm. And so instead of talking out and, and being honest with you mm-hmm. about what I'm seeing, where my concerns are, mm-hmm. I just start acting out of those feelings. So when we're at dinner and you wanna get the, the crawfish or the more expensive dish and I overreact, I don't know why we're married in this example. I'm sorry, but okay. you know, I'll, I'll talk to the proverbial you, my wife. But no, okay. uh, but yeah, you, when I overreact to you getting a more expensive, you know, dish, and you're like, "Why are you overreacting?" Well, it's because I've had this underlying distrust, which you're talking about. Mm-hmm. This these underlying narratives about you that I haven't talked to you about. So I, all I can do is act out of my emotions because I'm not comfortable talking about my emotions, and that's where most couples tend to see like, oh, we need to go see someone because we're having budgeting problems, but it's really <laughs> communication problems and intimacy problems. But yeah. How, how much, um, 
how much willingness do you see in the typical couple to actually try to work to resolution and reconciliation? Like it's it's hard work. Mm, I've yeah. done marriage for a lot of years, and there was a lot of a lot of there's been a lot of work. It's been blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, like it's, um, but th there's so much I wouldn't trade, uh -huh. you know, for for the relationship I have with my wife now. Um, is it, is it? Do you see good news out there? Do you see a lot of people giving up and just don't want to do the work? What what your what do you see? Yeah, that's a uh, that's tough because there's so many different circumstances and like I've, I've seen people who are who are married and I'm like I don't know if you guys should be should be married. Like he's like in blatant sin and he's openly putting your family at risk and you know um, uh, and so that in, in that situation it's not a matter of like how much. Mm -hmm. You know, how much work do you want to do to save this? It might be a matter of like, do you actually? How much work do you want to do to get out of it? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so that's a that's a that's a tough question to put over everyone. But I will say that what you believe about the universe and who controls it will influence you to to uh, influence your actions in marriage. It was just super simple and pretty generic. But mm -hmm. you know, I love my wife out of the love that God has for me. I try to reflect how I treat my wife with how I believe the creator of the universe, God, um, has designed this world to work. And so mm -hmm. I draw a lot of my inspiration um, from God and take, trying to take cues from God, right? Mm -hmm. I think so it's, I know it sounds and I always struggle because a lot of the churchy for I try to think about like who's listening yeah. where I say something churchy and they're like, what do you even mean by that? But it, it's it's pretty much the same thing. Like if yeah. you think the world, if you think the universe runs better when there's relationships of trust and long term relationships of pain and then growth and healing on the other side, mm -hmm. then marriage sticking out in marriage makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. You don't believe a parent. You don't believe a parent should give up on their child because the teenage years are rough and you don't believe that a husband should give up on their wife because year 12 and 13 were terrible. And you believe there's joy on the other side of long-term relationships that go through valleys. And mm -hmm. if, if, if you're, if you believe that, then you believe you should probably stick it out in marriage. Or mm -hmm. if you That's believe that God is willing to stick it out with you with all your valleys and your mountains, then you have no choice, but to reflect that onto the person you're dating. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah you, I think you and I could have a, a, a lot more conversation around this. So, so maybe I'll have you back, but uh, in fact, I would love that. But um, one thought, uh, the first marriage conference that my wife and I ever went to, marriage retreat, so to speak, um, was year 26. Okay. So 26 years of marriage. Read a couple of books when we first got married. Heard the occasional sermon or whatever. Yeah. But for the most part, didn't really study out how to be a good husband. Yeah. Um, but before that, I, or it must have been right before that, somewhere around that same time in life, I never complained about my wife to other people. She never complained about me to other people. Mm -hmm. That was just a place we weren't willing to go. So that I believe is, there's a degree of health there. Um, but one day I was complaining about her to God and in a very fatherly voice that I hope I'd never hear again, he said, you're talking about my daughter. That revelation right there is why I stopped watching pornography. That's my, the God that I trembled before looked at me and said, you better not ever look at my daughters this way or treat my daughter. Like I, I used to raise my, I, we get into arguments and sometimes I would raise my voice, not really proud of this, but then, you know, I'm, I just felt like I literally saw, I felt like I saw God over her shoulder. Mm. Cause I, cause it was very simple. Like if her dad were to hear this conversation, mm -hmm. he'd punch me in my face. Mm. How much more her heavenly father, mm. whether she's wrong or right, right. the tone I'm taking yeah, with yeah, her. Yeah. I don't want to have to see your dad about this. I don't want the <laughs> God of the universe who is your dad yeah. to hear. I can't box with him. Like I'm not. And so it just, it just helps my tone. It doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm saying I'm wrong or right or you're wrong or yeah, right. Yeah. But, but being able to see the, that the God who created the world, like created my wife and how I talk to her and how I treat her, I will be held account I am held accountable for that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it changed how I talked to my wife. Mm. When I was addicted to pornography, it just, it one day it clicked that like, this is God's daughter mm. who's in a moment of weakness or in a moment of confusion or in a moment of just making bad decisions, mm -hmm. decided to make this film. Mm. When I'm watching it, I'm watching someone's daughter who I'm going to go talk to in like three or four days. Like I'm going to go pray 
to God and he's going to be like, you just watch my daughter do something really disgraceful. Like, mm -hmm. you know, come on. Like, do you think you're, you're killing me? You're, you're giving views and clicks and revenue and attention to something that I'm not proud of that my daughter did. And, mm. and, and so it just, it, it, yeah, just, it just that, like that revelation right there that I, this is, it sounds so simple. Yeah. But like this is God's daughter. Yeah. I might want to change how I treat her mm. in light of who created her, mm. which we would call Imago Dei language and mm. image of God language mm. and, you know, all this other stuff. Mm. But I think just really simply. Imagine what kind of world we'd have if we all treated everybody around us as though they were God's kid. Come on. And like he was standing over their shoulder. Like, you talking to my kid like that? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that there's that's that's so loaded, but it's it's a good. I try to I I try to keep that top of mind that even as I'm talking to people, mm -hmm. like they have a soul, mm -hmm. uh, God loves them, mm -hmm. you know, and that helps me treat them like they're like I should. Yeah, and it sounds like you carry that into the workplace. Exactly. I mean, ten thousand percent. This is I, I'm not again. I'm not how how foolish of me to steward a human soul as an employee above a child of God and above may, uh, someone made in the image of God, mm -hmm. unlimited potential, mm -hmm. unlimited potential in this person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And all I want to get out of them is a good $12 workshop. an hour or $15 an hour. Come on. <laughs> like, what am I doing? Like, you know, again, so, um, yeah, they, they're, yeah. And there's, I mean, there's so many emotional, there's so many books written on, you know, employee engagement and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, but I, I think as you continue to read them and you continue to read the Bible, you start to see that there is a lot of overlap mm -hmm. in loving people well, paying them a fair wage, treating them like a brother and sister in Christ, even though you're their master and they might be your, the Bible would say slave or your employee, mm -hmm. but knowing that you have a relationship that supersedes boss and employee, which mm -hmm. is that of brother and sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. If you just wrestle with that alone, you're going to improve your talent management mm -hmm. systems because before I owe you anything as a boss, I owe you love as a human. Mm -hmm. And if I cover that base, I'll probably do a great job of being a boss as a byproduct of that. Beautiful. Lashad, this has been an absolute treasure and pleasure for me today. <laughs> I've enjoyed getting to hang out with you. Yeah. You share some good stuff. Yeah. Let's have you back. Okay. All right. Love you, brother. Right. Love you, man. <laughs>